Um, so, so yes, yeah, since I'm the first presenter in this session, and it's actually all of the presenters are part of um, a collaborative project that we've been working on for the past couple of years um, under the um, Water for Food Production Systems program um, with uh, NIFA and AFRI. Um, so I thought first I'd just kind of give an, an overview of the overall project, and you'll hear later on from some of the other um, members of, the, of our project team and what they've been working on. And then we also have a demonstration tomorrow morning of the decision support tool. Um, the, I would say the, what would you say the beta version guys, the beta version of our decision support tool is tomorrow morning. So the overarching project goal of this entire team is to develop a decision, decision support tool for technology selection um, in the Hagen dairy industries focused on um, liquid manures and wastewaters. And so within the team, we have a really a breadth of expertise um, because the team also includes people working on um, new technologies focused on membranes and electrochemical technology. And then we also have um, extension um, folks on our team that are engaging stakeholders and also part of the decision support tool. So um, the team now spans, let's see, I moved, so I was at the University of Arkansas when we started this and recently moved to Penn State. Um, so Arkansas really was the um, core um, sort of lead institution. And then we've got um, Case Western, um, Colorado School of Mines, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and the University of Missouri. And like I said, our expertise really ranges from um, engineering expertise, um, protein engineering, chemical engineering, environmental engineering, to um, agronomy, uh, economics, and um, we have a whole team working on the decision support tool, and then stakeholder outreach. So the, the big driver for this team and when we when we got together to write the original proposal was um, the issue of, of limited phosphorus supplies. And I put this slide first, or I guess right after the team introduction, um, just to kind of show um, what is what has happened in the past in terms of fertilizer price volatility and what's happening now. So I'm sure many of you are aware and have seen some of these numbers. Um, this was a graph that I pulled that just went through the end of 2021. And already um, we can see this increase as a result of um, the pandemic and other global events. And then just this morning, I pulled this table from the World Bank website showing up through March. And you can see that already from the end of 2021, we were at maybe in the 600s there of dollars per um, megaton, and now we're up to in the 900s in some cases for diammonium phosphate. So fertilizer price volatility um, over um, the past number of decades uh, has been increasing and of course occurs whenever we have sort of global events. The last big one was of course the 2008 market crash where we saw huge price increases as well. So this is all indicative, of course, of, of, of instability and insecurity of our resources. The primary one um, being phosphorus. Um, phosphorus, of course, is limited in supply. It is a mined mineral um, that we will run out of eventually or at a minimum just have very limited access to, to good sources of supply. And of course, there are geopolitical challenges to where phosphate rock um, mining occurs. My presentation, this presentation is really gonna focus on the technology side. And my goal with this presentation was just to kind of give you an overview of the technology itself that we're working on. And then some of the questions that we've been asked uh, and some of the questions that we've been working on. So our target in terms of technology and nutrient recovery, phosphorus recovery is struvite. So struvite, for those of you who don't know, the reaction's up there, but it's magnesium, ammonium, phosphate. So you can recover both ammonium and phosphate, um, and they are in regular struvite, they are in a one-to-one -one, um, ratio with magnesium. So the um, more developed sort of incumbent process for recovering struvite is a chemical process. There are multiple companies that have been developing um, technologies around this reaction. One of them is Ostara. Um, but all of them use really similar techniques in that they, they have to add a magnesium salt 
and a base like caustic sodium hydroxide to raise the pH. Um, the magnesium, of course, is needed because you have less magnesium in your wastewater sources than ammonium and phosphate. And the base is needed because you have to control the pH in order to get primarily struvite in your precipitate. The two downsides um, that we see in this approach are revolve around this, this chemical addition. A, you have to add chemicals, which is a um, constant um, requirement in terms of operating this kind of technology. Um, the chemicals can be um, expensive, especially the base. And because you're adding these chemicals, they're, they're salts, you are adding additional salinity. So if you are recovering um, struvite from, for example, a, 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 you know, a holding pond that had liquid manure at fairly high phosphate concentrations, you're going to be adding a lot of additional salinity into that water in order to recover the phosphorus. So the technology that we've been looking at is an electrochemical approach. So we essentially use electricity to drive an electrode-based process where we use a magnesium anode uh, and a stainless steel cathode. Um, it's a really sim fairly simple reactor design. You can see our, our lab scale um, batch reactor here that we've used during this project. So really simple design, um, not really complicated. Um, but what this system allows us to do is to eliminate any additional salt addition while we're recovering phosphorus. And we supply both our magnesium and our base through the electrochemistry. So this magnesium electrode is, is a consumable. So it corrodes when you operate the cell and it releases magnesium ions that then precipitate with the ammonium and phosphate in solution. Um, through these reactions, you also get um, hydroxide uh, ion production. So as the magnesium corrodes and then also the reactions at the stainless steel cathode produce OH molecules that help adjust our pH up to hit sort of that sweet spot for where we see struvite production. One of the first things that we did in this project uh, actually was to scale up our, our scale up our lab sort of lab scale reactors. So this was because our agronomist on the team needed electrochemically precipitated struvite to be working on his agronomy studies. And so really out of the gate, before we were really <laughs> very familiar with the system and how to optimize it, we were already scaling up. Really, the, the, I think the, big, the two big takeaways for me on that was it really challenged us as the engineering side of the team to think um, beyond our little systems that we usually operate in the lab. It really challenged us to figure out how are we going to make several kilograms for the agronomy studies when we don't really know all of the details of this system. So I think it was a really, it was a great challenge. Um, we were able to produce a couple of kilograms for the agronomy studies. And then we also very quickly identified one of the major challenges with this kind of a system, which is electrode fouling. So you can see in this image right here, letter C, you can see the white um, particles that are attached to the electrode, that's precipitated struvite, it can attach to the electrodes. So also right out of right, you know, in, in the beginning of this project, we realized we had to figure out how to address electrode fouling for this to ever be something that people would consider um, transitioning out of the lab. One of the things that one of my graduate students has been working on is how to solve this problem. And I, I basically said to her, figure out a way to use electrochemistry to address electrode fouling. I don't wanna add chemicals. I don't wanna take it offline. And I don't wanna be replacing the electrodes all the time. And I don't wanna to have to do mechanical cleaning. I mean, anything that is gonna make this more complicated is not gonna be realistic. So she actually went and looked in the literature and some other related electrochemical literature and proposed that we try this voltage modulation approach. So basically what we do is we um, use, we scan our voltage of our magnesium electrode and measure the current. And right when you see the current going up like this, that is when our magnesium is starting to corrode. So that is the voltage range we know we need to be in for magnesium to be released from the electrode for struvite precipitation. So we take that measurement and then what she did was she um, assigned a, a median value of the voltage and a range, basically a plus and minus. And she has looked at various waveforms of basically modulating the voltage from that medium voltage plus and minus um, 
um, over, over time. And she's looked at several different waveforms. Um, so you can see three here, sine, sawtooth, and square. And she's also looked at the frequency of that waveform. So how quickly do we actually modulate that voltage? And what has been really incredible to see in her results is that um, the waveform doesn't matter too much, but the frequency really matters a lot. And so what we've been able to do is zero in on a frequency of about three to five um, hertz that, that appears to work really well in terms of essentially eliminating most of the fouling that we were seeing. And as a result, increasing our, our phosphate recovery, increasing the mass recovered of struvite, and also actually has enabled us to optimize um, and significantly decrease our energy demand. So it's been a, a pretty incredible study that she's, she's done and figured out how to address fouling. So one of the other things that we've taken a look at is how water chemistry parameters affect um, our overall electrode performance and, and system design. And so the next two slides kind of show you two takeaways. The one is that salinity actually can be helpful in that the chloride, you know, the anions that are present in a wastewater can actually enhance the magnesium corrosion and therefore enhance our um, struvite recovery. Um, the importance here is really that if you were to operate this reactor in with a waste or, wastewater source, you would really want to know what the background salinity is in that wastewater to optimize the system performance. Similarly, um, we've done a number of studies with um, real wastewater sources in both the with that are municipal sector wastewater sources and ag sector wastewater sources. So here you're looking at four wastewaters that we've tested. The, the top one was actually a poultry um, processing wastewater source. And then these bottom three were actually municipal wastewater sources. Um, we have other studies where we've also looked at hog and dairy wastewater sources, but essentially the story continues to turn out the same, which is depending on other water chemistry components. So for example, how much ammonia is in your water, how much calcium is in your water. The chloride, of course, is um, in terms of salinity that I mentioned in the previous slide, your total hardness so um, and your total organic carbon. All of these can actually impact you know, how much precipitation we see, how much true we can recover, and the energy efficiency of the process. And um, we've really taken the approach of just trying to understand how these water chemistry parameters and their ranges can affect our system performance. But I would say that the takeaway from an engineering perspective is that you would want to know those parameter ranges to be able to optimize operation of your system. So again, just needing to know the water chemistry of your wastewater source and optimizing for that particular source. So the other, one of the other aspects that we've worked on um, really came out of getting um, some producer feedback at the beginning of this project where people really said, you know, struvite is nice, but we don't like it because you have a one-to-one and to P ratio, um, and you're kind of stuck with that one to one and to P ratio in the struvite compound. Is there a way to actually treat wastewater and produce, you know, product streams that would allow you to control the ratio of N to P depending on how we want to use it, where we want to use it? And so, one of the things we've been looking at is producing K struvite, which is magnesium potassium phosphate instead of magnesium ammonium phosphate. And what this would allow us to do is precipitate the phosphate in a usable fertilizer solid that can be dried and shipped you know, outside of the region and also produce a liquid ammonia stream that could be used for fertigation um, separately. So this part of the project is still sort of in preliminary um, work, but what we've done is looked at, we've done some th thermodynamic modeling to figure out, okay, what precipitates would um, be precipitating in addition to K-struvite and then also looking at the pH dependence. So this red line is K-struvite. And what you can see is that there is definitely in terms of the theoretical predictions, a pH dependence um, for this compound. And what we've seen in our preliminary experiments, so here you're looking at electron micro microscopy images of the precipitates that we obtain. And really the thing to notice here is that the morphology changes. So we go from these sort of um, 
round particulates to eventually needle shaped as you go from pH nine through 10 to 11. And I don't have the, the data on here, but I can tell you that this is actually a change from primarily a magnesium phosphate precipitate to at pH 11, a K struvite potassium magnesium phosphate. So we're seeing um, a very clear pH dependence that would need to be controlled if you wanted to produce K struvite from your wastewater. But we are, we're excited because there hasn't been much work on K struvite. So we were excited just to be able to produce it and to show that we are getting K struvite um, primarily in our precipitates. And we think that this could be a useful path if you wanted to really separate your nitrogen from your phosphorus in a wastewater treatment process. So one of the other things on the team that we've been working on is going from batch to flow cell reactor design. And so, so one of the initial studies that some of our team members did was to look at how would um, the flow regime and also temperature affect struvite. And so these are two um, sets of results that are from x-ray diffraction measurements. X-ray diffraction measurements essentially tell you what compound is there. And so we're comparing um, struvite as a standard to newberryite, which is magnesium phosphate precipitate. And you can see both for, for temperature on the left and um, RPM is, is essentially flow, flow regime on the right, that struvite precipitation is definitely temperature dependent, although we have a very wide range of temperature where we can operate essentially from 20, perhaps to 40, 45 degrees C where you could get struvite. And then the flow regime, um, you really need to be at a higher flow rate. So a higher RPM showed uh, more consistent struvite precipitation. So this is just us starting to figure out if you were to develop a flow reactor, how would you need to optimize it again to make sure we were getting um, struvite. So on the membrane side of things, we really wanted to take sort of lessons learned in the water and electrochemical technologies um, sectors and apply them to potentially um, issues in the agricultural sector in terms of separating and controlling where your ions go. And so this is work in our, in our team looking at being able to control polymer structure, which therefore allows you to control salt separation and transport. And then finally, we have um, a really cool piece of the team where we have a protein engineer, a peptide engineer on the team, and she has been looking at how to use um, peptides, which are really short chain, short chain amino acids, so really small protein like compounds to understand how peptides could be used in different aspects of our project. And so one of the things that we've been looking at is whether peptide engineering technology can actually help to enhance struvite um, production. And so what we see across the board is that peptides, if selected and designed correctly, can actually increase yield and their kinetics. So they, they precipitate faster. And we also get larger particle sizes, which is really useful for collection and eventual processing into like fertilizer pellets. You know, all of this work is very early stage compared to some of the other, you know, talks here. So we're not doing piloting. It's certainly all still lab scale. Um, but we really have tried to think about, you know, how do these engineering technologies, we you know, realistically, you know, how do we think about them at the lab scale to try to develop them for needs and questions that we hear um, from our team and in the ag sector. Uh, and so the key takeaways are, you know, that we've been able to demonstrate batch reactor scale up and flow cell design. We have addressed electrode fouling, which was really exciting. Um, we're able to optimize energy consumption and struvite recovery by understanding the water chemistry. And we're seeing some interesting things with peptide technology and membrane technology that, you know, could help enhance struvite recovery, nutrient management, ion management. Um, and that we think, you know, it is possible to use engineering technology to control N to P ratio when you are trying to recover both water and nutrients. And thank you and I'll take any questions. So no, so we don't take um, straight manure. We, we take the liquid portion and we do a, what I would call like a screen filter. So we screen out, we would remove, we remove big particles. So no, and I don't think we're, we're not treating it. I think at the point that you're asking. Your original equation there had some three aquavirins and three hydrogen forms. Is there still a lot to get to the alkaline point? Could they be possible? 
support some of these products? So the hydrogen is a question that we've been working on answering in our team. Um, it is a possibility, although I don't know that it's a huge economic addition in terms of the byproduct. And Aaron, I don't know if you can comment on that more. It's more Leah's work, right? Yeah. So our economics team has been working on this question. Yes, we produce hydrogen. Yes, it matters how you run the reactor. But I think the preliminary assessment is that it's not a huge amount and it's a question of whether or not it would be an economic benefit, particularly with the, you know, how it's priced right now. 